Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the Theology and the Arts Lunch at United Theological Seminary. Um, I am Jennifer Oz Freeman, the Assistant Professor and Program Director for Theology and the Arts, and really excited to have our beloved Stephanie Pescatelli uh, leading us down a mystical path <laughs> today. Um, so with that, I'll just hand it over to you, Stephanie, and you should be able to share your screen. Cool. Yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this artist with you all. That has sort of been my recent obsession. Um, I have uh, Jennifer to blame for that. Um, so this, this Arts Lunch was brought to you by Jennifer, uh, which now that I'm thinking about it, might have been just like this really long game ploy to get me to present at Arts Lunch. <laughs> but in, in class last semester, um, she sort of, it wasn't, it didn't totally fit into the lesson plan, but she just started talking about Hema Auckland, um, who's the artist we'll be talking about today, because she thought I would be into her, and she was, she was right. Um, so Demian's not here, but he gets a lot of credit for being a theological matchmaker here at United. Um, and I would say that Jennifer, um, also can claim that title, um, and of course, what that also leads to is subsequently buying a lot of expensive books about my about whatever you become obsessed with. So that also happened. This art lunch is maybe my justification for buying all these books about Helma. <laughs> um, but really excited to have this conversation today. And what really drew me in about Helma off Clint um, was really just, I mean, she just has a really remarkable story, as we'll see. Um, but my own research and interests really pivots on this question and this challenge of looking at things that are kind of claimed by the, the secular spheres. So in this case, the art world or art objects, um, but also just questions about politics, how we are as humans together, science, et cetera, looking at these things that, that is claimed by the profane um, through a sacred or theological lens and seeing what we might uncover from sort of doing that contamination, if you will, responsible contamination um, between sectors and spheres. Um, so I call it, you know, both theological, but I would also say a theopoetic lens, which um, for those of you who don't know what theopoetics is, theology is in a, in a crude sense, um, talking about God and theopoetics in a, in, in, in a simple sense is making about God. So what happens when we, when we look at um, questions of divine um, and do that through art in our bodies. Um, and so Hilma is also is definitely very interesting to me because she is, as we'll see, kind of a pioneer in blurring these boundaries between science and art and spirituality. Um, and it's Women's History Month. Um, and so we'll see that her, her story and the way that she blurred these boundaries didn't really fit into the boxes that were around her and, and people still don't really know what to do with her. Um, and so we are going to see whether um, talking about her at, in a seminary context, maybe we can consider um, different ways of looking at her story um, and, and what might be uncovered by that. So to start off, before I start the presentation, I'm just gonna show a really short um, video clip. And this is a promotional trailer for a documentary that recently came out about her um, after her recent kind of like breakthrough to the art scene. So as you might've seen in the, the blurb about this talk, um, while she created a lot of her work um, right at the beginning, um, you know, between the late 1800s, early 1900s, it wasn't until very recently that she's gotten some attention and her art has been released. And part of that is because after, you know, as she was nearing the end of her life, she created a lot of her work kind of in secret-ish um, and in her will said, I don't want any of my work to be shown until 20 years after I die which I think is one of the most um, remarkable aspects of her story. And we'll return to that again and again and why she might have done that and how that was very 
unusual, especially for um, an artist. So I am going to do, 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 do. do oh, if I can, there we go. We'll just watch this video to kind of set that scene. Can everybody see? Cool. She was well educated. She had a mind of her own and she painted like nobody else. In order to tell the history of abstraction now, you have to rewrite it. Because basically, all the people who said, it happened in this year, well, no, it didn't. Plötzlich, wie aus dem Nichts, taucht diese Frau auf, die hat vor Kandinsky abstrakt gemalt, völlig unabhängig, hat dieses riesige Öffre geschaffen. Hilmar auf Klint, dadurch, dass sie so früh war, eine Art der Erschütterung in die Kunstgeschichte bringt, die dazu führt, dass manche sagen, dann lassen wir sie lieber ganz draußen. Artistry is a man's suit, so the fiber is man. If you compare her to suppose a genius man, their steps towards abstraction were very timid, very slow. Hat versucht einfach zu entgrenzen das, was wir unter unter Wirklichkeit verstehen. It was a new way of painting. It was a new form of art. Ich kenne eigentlich keinen Övre, mit dem man das vergleichen könnte. She walked away at the same time as she made the way. That's not easy to be a pioneer. And so that's showing that kind of it's as an interesting little snapshot of her story, but also it just really captures this moment of, you know, why people are paying attention to her and how they're paying attention to her. Um, there's a lot of nice little lines in there. One of them is like, would it be better if we just leave her out of art history because it's so disruptive to, you know, the, the textbooks that have already been created, um, so to speak. And, I think that, you know, one, one thing that I'm kind of proposing today is that, you know, sure, you can leave her out of her history. I think there are other places um, where her story can live and maybe might even reveal more of what her intent was um, in creating all of her work. Um, so now I'll do, 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 do this again and share these. Go. Um, so here she is. I love this this photo of her. <laughs> um, so while she was very challenged, you know, by you know stepping into this sphere where maybe women weren't welcome, I love this photo because it just she's like she's owning her studio space and she really just kind of owns the space that she is able to claim. Um, in her life. So as we kind of look into her story um, and hold her story in this space together, um, the kind of the central question that I'm inviting people to kind of hold in their, their minds and their hearts as we look at her work and hear about um, what she put forth in the world is what can we see about her legacy and maybe our own callings and creativity and work by looking at her story, um, not just through the art history lens, but also through a theological and theopoetic lens um, and bringing all of ourselves to that table, whatever kind of religious background or story that you have um, and seeing you know, what might her message have to say to us.
today in particular. Um, so today, um, I'll try to fit in as much as possible. I'm looking at the time already and I'm like, oh, Demi, and there's just too much space to hold. Um, and I think, you know, like Jennifer also says, is I think there's so many images and I think I was a little greedy, but we'll see how much we can get through today um, in her story and kind of looking at and, and spending time with some of her work together. And then I do have a little like creative spiritual exercise that we can do at the end um, because there's the theology part and then there's the also like I think it would be a disservice to what she was putting forth not to make a little bit um, an inspiration of of what she has to offer here um, and again like I said at the beginning there's a lot of wisdom in the room and so I just encourage people to I can't see everybody so just unmute and if you have a question or a comment um, feel free to to interject at any point um, so just to paint the scene here um, and talk a little bit about her early formation um, and what went into this. She was born in um, Sweden in 1862 um, to a most likely a Lutheran family, given it was that it was Sweden, um, kind of upper class bourgeois setting. Um, and you'll see this lower, these are kind of poor images, but the lower one, that's the Naval Academy that she was raised in. Um, so her dad was in the Navy, as was her grandfather, who was a cartographer. And so we can assume that she she had a pretty good education um, from the get go. And um, even though you know she had limited opportunities, she did have some privilege in that sense. And then this top photo, um, she spent her nephew talked a lot about how they spent summers on this beautiful island. Um, and he talked about mushrooming and blueberry picking together, playing in the woods. And we'll see that that exposure and appreciation to the natural world was really important to her spirituality. And we'll see that kind of play out in her work later. Um, also in early on, she had kind of a tragic, but also transformative um, life event, which is that her sister um, passed away um, when she was 10 and it's documented that this was kind of a turning point for her because she played a really close role in kind of helping her sister accept that she was dying and kind of offered what we would call pastoral care um, to her sister during that time. And it was after that she started going to seances and became really interested in the occult. Um, and, you know, we can maybe presume that she was trying to commune with her sister, but in any case, it was kind of a spiritual breakthrough moment for her. Um, but throughout that time, she still considered, she still considered herself a Christian um, and did so throughout her life. So as she went to school and then later, as she became an artist, Christianity is still really central to her practice um, and theology. So then she leaves to school um, and she attends to an academy, the Royal Swedish Academy of Fine Arts in Stockholm. Um, and then she's there from, 80, from 1882 to 1887. And there she is one of the first female students to graduate with a cohort of um, male colleagues. She graduated with honors, um, so did really well. And then even was able to make a livelihood for herself um, with her art. So her early works like this one, um, which is a, a, just kind of a landscape painting were very much of the style and constructs of the time. And she was really successful within those boxes. In fact, she did illustrations for medical books. Um, and in the next slide we'll see, she also did some portraits um, of dogs apparently and people. Um, but she was able to support herself and but during this time um, it was really women were seen as you know it was starting to be acknowledged that oh yeah women can be artists um, but more in the sense that they can copy what is what is happening and uh, what is in the world really well but they're not necessarily seen or expected to be innovators um, which we'll see she definitely proved that very wrong and just 
importantly, since we are looking at her life through a more theological lens, um, important to her formation and also in kind of painting the landscape in which she started creating at the time. Um, again, she brought Chris, she carried Christianity with her, but we'll see it. She was a very, like many of us at United, a very complex, multiple belonging spiritual being. Um, and there were a lot of different things that influenced that Buddhism, Hinduism, um, and sort of these other kind of um, like theosophy and kind of a constellation of, of spiritual orientations that really believed in finding wisdom and truth in all religious traditions um, and combining that with really scientific discoveries that were happening at that day at, in this time. Um, so this is when you know there was people proving the existence of electromagnetic waves, um, discovering the power to do x-rays. So seeing this, this world that was sort of underneath the visible structure, this unseen world, um, subatomic sub -atomic particles. Um, and this is also when Darwin's theory of evolution was being talked about in sort of this controversial way. And theosophy and some of these, these spiritual frameworks really embraced these ideas and tried to combine them with spirituality. So we have this, this boundary blurring kind of already happening. Um, and took things like Darwin's theory of evolution and said, yes, that, do, that does describe what's happening in, in the material world with living beings. And it has something to do, has something to say about spiritual evolution. And that's also happening at the same time. Um, so in this picture, you'll see that's Marie Curie. There's um, Helena Blodowatsky who founded the Theosophy Movement, um, which was really central to um, Helma's work and inspiration. So again, about finding that unifying truth between polarities um, that is seen as being kind of lost at the world's creation, world's creation. And we'll see that show up in some of her work later. And during this time, there was also kind of this trend in mediumship and spiritualism. So this belief that we could channel voices from beyond. Um, and there were, it was very popular at that time um, and including in like more academic or intellectual artistic circles. Um, but there's a picture here of the Fox sisters um, who were known in their performances of mediumship. And there's a little picture of some folks levitating a table. Um, and so there were some authentic, maybe mystical experiences and also some performance um, and one might say forgery happening here as well. Um, and this is just to kind of do some name dropping, um, just to say that like, you know, Helma Offklint was not taken seriously because of her mystical practices, but this was just happening at the time. And even, you know, people like Gandhi and a lot of these, you know, male authors were very influenced by theosophy and her con male contemporaries at the time who are credited with pioneering abstraction. Um, wrote books about and talked about in a very, one might say egotistical way about how their spirituality and their art were becoming one. Um, and Kandinsky himself is, it's documented that he predated some of his paintings to kind of just to, just to he really wanted to claim that he was sort of the person who came up with abstraction, um, whatever that means. Um, so while theosophy and some of these realms um, where women's voices were very much dominant and the founders and the leaders in this movement is sort of seen as like quackery and there's a lot of corruption, I would argue that in some of these other spaces, um, that kind of thing is still happening, but I don't think it makes the work that came out of it any less interesting or legitimate. And I don't want to spend too much time on these guys because they get enough of that, um, but just in case these are just some of the main paintings and works that came from um, them that, that were definitely dated as being later than some of Helmo's work, just for the record. Um, but moving on, move back to Helma's story. Um, so the way that she interacted with these spiritual movements um, was in, was, it was very much part of her personal spiritual practice. And so 
she had this group of other women who were, they were together for 10 years doing this practice while she was in art school. And one of them was one of her colleagues. Um, they called themselves the five. And they met um, very regularly. Um, and this is what um, a, sort of a systematic study of mediumship, but also worship that they were doing together. So they would get together and this is a picture of one of their altars and they would kind of set up this space this way. And they would begin their sessions with, a, um, in, a, in sort of like a chapel. So they would do a prayer, a meditation. They would even read a sermon out loud together. Um, then they would discuss text from the New Testament. Okay, like this is this is pretty normal. And then they would go into their seance. <laughs> um, so Christian and then plus some extra stuff. And the way that they would do this, they would often use a psychograph, um, but a lot of it was that they would take turns. One of them would be the medium who was sort of channeling the spiritual voice. Um, another one would serve as the scribe and they connected with several different beings that they named over the 10 years and sort of meticulously recorded both the voices through text, um, but also drawings, which I have some examples. So here's their notebook and some of their early drawings that they channeled. And what was really important was that the authorship of, of these early works and documentation wasn't important because their higher message was what they wanted to capture. So they didn't sign their work like, this is mine. Um, it was very much a communal effort of channeling these messages. So you'll see these Christian themes um, and also the spiral which um, and botanical themes that end up going, you know, showing up in Helma's work later, as well as this, this methodology of automatic drawing and writing um, really becomes how she, she does her most important work. So that kind of leads into her own calling and this image is taken from the documentary um it doesn't obviously it's not a real photograph <laughs> this is me painting in my bedroom no <laughs> um so it comes about and this is sort of a gradual process of these spirits kind of asking more of the women um in the five but eventually they make a pointed request um for um, them to take on this great commission. So this is in 1906, and this is when Helma was 43, to paint these great spiritual truths. Um, and it was supposed to only take a year. And the others in the group were like, no, that's, that's bad news. Like that's going a little too far. Um, this might lead to madness. <laughs> and Helma was like, hell yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and originally I was going to like ask everybody like, would you take this call? But I realized I'm talking to a bunch of people who pretty much did say yes to some sort of call. Um, so kind of might may be able to sympathize with Helma's, you know, uh, unconventional turn at this point, her big yes. So she began painting, um, and we see this is not just a, oh, I'm going to take this commission from any old patron. She really, you know, for, for 10 months, she, she prepared by fasting and taking on a specific diet and spiritually preparing herself for this, this work. Um, and as she begins um, painting, she says here, and eventually the work that she does over the next decade, this is her the manifestation of this calling is called the, the paintings for the temple. Um, and she brings in this kind of this same methodology that she used with the five. She says, the pictures were painted directly through me with no preliminary drawing and with great power. I had no idea what the images were supposed to represent. And yet I worked quickly and with assurance without changing a single brush stroke. So this is a little teaser of, of some of her work, which we're gonna start looking at right now. Um, this is from the first series. And you can see down there that the, the caption and her writing is, is matter is good and spirit is good. Um, so something to just pay attention to as we look to her work, that's very much kind of a, a theo, theosophy, um, kind of, it's, it's an emergence of a lot of different 
and I think theological ideas and traditions, but a lot of it is about taking a duality and really moving towards this uh, mingling of, of duality and a unity. Um, so before, this is just briefly because this is super interesting and might also help us when we're looking at her work. Um, she eventually kind of came up with her own system of symbols and language um, drawn from what emerged from these spirits, but also different religions, um, science, nature. Um, and she has, I mean, I have like pages and pages of these symbols and what they mean. And one like AH has like 10 different meanings, bread and wine, um, symbol of dual truth. And some of the major ones um, that show up in her work to pay attention to are the loopy W, which we saw in that last slide, and the U, um, which stand for matter and spirit. So anytime you see those two symbols, overlapping circles, it's a lot of circular lines, um, means unity. Yellow um, stands for masculinity in her work. Blue is femininity. And then green is harmon harmonious union. And then one of the most important motifs that we'll see and be playing with is spirals, um, which really just means everything, but really stands for this spiritual evolution, growth and change. And they'll show up in the form of snails, um, but also these really interesting like cosmic coil looking things. So the first one we're going to look at here, and I wish I could see more of your faces. Um, so the first group that she did in the temple series is called Primordial Chaos. And I wish I could, I mean, they're really meant to be seen in series, like all of them together, but we're just going to, because of the limits of time, we'll have to kind of just pick and choose a little bit. So the ones before this series are these sort of blobs like the primordial ooze um, and then eventually there's some forms that emerge and this is one of the later ones um, so i'm just just let's just take a moment and um and call out what you what you're noticing in in the symbols um and also just kind of the like overall effect and what you see Lots of uh, yellow and blue. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of yellow and blue and kind of coming together to form these green colors. When yeah, I think I of primordial, oh, when I think of primordial chaos, I don't feel calm when I think of that word. Yet in this painting, I think there is a, and it's like unity of these colors. Um, there's a very calm feeling to it. Mm. I'm, I'm noticing these three streams, yellow streams in the top right. And are they vegetative? Or are they like a comet, the tails of a comet? I, I don't know, but are they exhalations? Yeah. I'm not asking for answers, I'm just wondering. Um, yeah, I think in a lot of her work, there's like things look like they might be really tiny, like, oh, is this a cell? Is this a marine invertebrate? Or is this a planet? <laughs> um, there's kind of an ambiguity around like, yeah, whether it's it's earthly or cosmic. But yeah, I, it does look like it could be exhaling. I like that. It's kind of a controlled um, abstract approach uh, to art, even though the, the image as I see it looks uh, looks more like a graphic symbol, which I think is what's really intriguing to me. Yeah. There's sort of these, yeah, like flowy forms and also more geometric. And I even see like there's a, cr a cross um, mm -hmm. in the middle there. You might even say like, looks like there's two eyes or something, but yeah, there's a lot of different, different things going on. Anyone else? Uh, 
I love that she chose the words masculine and feminine rather than man and woman and kind of, you know, and then also does this green where it's like mixing the two, like we all, we all are striving for that balance to have both and not just one or the other. Yeah, thanks Scotty. And I put up another little image here um, where you can see that there's a lot of movement between the duality, like coming, like polarizing and then coming together and then mixing and then coming back. Um, there's in, in her, if you look at the series as a whole, there's just like a lot of movement back and forth like that and boundary crossing, if we will. Um, and there's the little snail showing up. And these are also, it's interesting that after she created this work, so these are um, screenshots or uh, scanned in photos of her. She cataloged her work herself after she was done. So the ones on the left are these photographs she took of each piece. And then she did like a little mini watercolor rendition so that she'd have it documented and she could share with people, which I think is really cool. And this is her next series was the arrow series. So again, we're seeing like these kind of vesicles or blobby shapes, almost like a helix and more of her, her symbols here, which I would love to just like sit and be like, what is, what's the L like, look, look, it's up and like do that kind of level. But we're just going to kind of like take in some of these just as they are for now. And again, can kind of see them in a series. So bringing in pink, which obviously stands for love, um, among other things. And then we can't leave out um, the 10 largest, <laughs> which is um, next in the series. So I know Meg has been to this exhibit that's photographed here at the Guggenheim. And they really are, like this is how she intended them to be displayed. It's sort of in this grand succession. Um, and you can see just this, her works just before were, you know, modestly sized. And these are over three meters tall each. So you can kind of see them to scale with these people sitting in front of them. Um, and they're just, I mean, remarkable. Um, and I think, do, 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 do. So each one of these, um, in these series kind of represents a, a life stage. Um, and one could say mostly human centered, but we'll see that they definitely mingle, her symbols definitely point to mingling like human development and non-human development and other life forms. Um, so I'll just, um, for the sake of time, we'll just kind of like as if we were walking through a gallery, we'll just kind of like cycle, I'll just cycle through some of these in succession. And if you see forms or words that come to mind, um, if you could just throw them into the chat as they come as they come to you, and we can kind of share in the experience like that together. Um, so the first, and another cool thing is that while she was they while they were hanging these, they noticed that they could detect footprints. Um, so in order to create this, she obviously had to like put these canvases down on the ground and like paint like that picture showed paint on the ground like that and kind of scale them. So it was a very like um, the physicality of it was pretty intense. Um, and to that effect, um, when she received these instructions to paint, there was also instructions to rest between paintings. So she would paint them in succession in her creation. And then there was specific instructions about like take three weeks now to rest after you've painted them. Um, which I think is beautiful. So these- And Stephanie, are these acrylic or is it is it oil? Are these... That's a great question. These are tempera paints, um, so not oil. So these are the paints that's pigment mixed and she mixed them with, um, with egg, with egg yolk, um, which, raised a lot of attention because she was ordering a lot of eggs to paint these, <laughs> these massive paintings all at once. She just kind of, I don't know what kind of source she had, but people were kind of like, why is she eating so many eggs? 
And does that what what does that do real quickly? The um, someone might know the egg yolk with the paint. Does it just does it give it some sort of translucent or pick like a yeah or a darker color or something? What does the egg yolk do for that? I think Jennifer might know more than I do, but I think it's mostly uh, yeah. Yeah, like the material to bind it. Yeah, of. the binding. Yeah, and it would be mixed with oh. pigment, like a powdered pigment. And I think there was, was there a shot of that at the beginning of the video or did you? Sh I think so. Yeah. I can't remember if it was in this one or not. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Like Thanks. It looked like a weird omelet, green omelet maybe. Anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, these two that I'm showing first here are um, childhood. So they're the earliest in the series. And again, feel free to just any words that are coming to mind, add them to our little, our chat. And these next two are youth. So the next kind of like life stage unfolding. And now we're just moving right along to uh, adulthood. <laughs> Again, lots of symbols and shapes in here. I know my Aunt Marilyn's in the room. You can see some Art Nouveau influences from that time. Yes, scrubs. And then these last two are old age. Some real direct contrast with Kandinsky and Mondrian with their charred, hard lines. Yeah. Well, actually, it's. I'm glad you brought that up. So this next, you'll see that she does. She blends those soft lines, and then here in this last image, you'll see this like kind of more geometric. But they're not. It never feels like things are captured in the geometric lines. They're always kind of spilling out and coming back and spilling out. So there's definitely. Yeah, she's a different relationship to that. I would, I would, I think that might have something to do with the fact that she started this work um, from this place of medium mediumship. So just kind of this automatic drawing, which isn't named in the art world, of course, until later with the surrealists um, as a as a method. But yeah, she's less, it's less constrained. That's a really good point. Um, so at this time, she her the painting series. Yes, this is one Sonic. Yes. Um, oh, I love it. Um, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep us kind of rolling. But in just briefly, she her process was sort of interrupted. Um, two things happened. One um, is that she. She never tried to show her work in an art gallery. So a lot of the art critics are like, this isn't real art because it was never shown. And she didn't really, that wasn't really her, her point. Um, but she did try to get support to build the temple that she envisioned these being housed in from Rudolf, Ste Rudolf Steiner, who was another spiritual leader in these kind of theosophical movements. And he was kind of like, eh, these are cool, but I don't know, like, I think that your your method's a little weird. It was too passive, he called it, um, the way that she received these images. And so we don't know exactly how that impacted her, but at that time is when she stopped painting. Um, but she also stopped because she was taking care of her mother who at that time um, was sick and eventually went blind. So, you know, we, 
we're not sure what happened. I think she definitely was disappointed not to have his support, but it might have been more because it, you know, she really wanted these to be shown in that space and that within her, her kind of like spiritual circle. But in any case, in 1912, she returns to her work. Um, and at that time, there's definitely like a noticeable shift in her methodology. It becomes even more, she was receiving these images not just um, in pieces or kind of gradually, but she'll receive the images as a whole and then paint them. And she becomes even more uninhibited um, in the way that she does this. Um, so you'll see, I think like more and more her, her, her vocation and her spirituality are, are becoming like even more fused in this calling and how, and how her, um, her technique evolves. So this next series, um, is evolution. Um, so again, we'll see, you'll see there's the Ouroboros. There's a lot of different um, symbols being merged here. There's a lot, there's the cross, again, more of the, um, yeah, grubs and wings and all sorts of life forms. And again, the, yeah, the, the duality is kind of mingling in the middle. Um, And some of her works that are not as shown as much have even more explicit um, Christian imagery, which shows up in a bolder way once she returns um, after 1912. She becomes, I think, just more emboldened in both her technique and also her, you know, she's like, well, that's fine. I'm going to do everything that I want now. I think she just kind of like lets it all loose at that point. Um, so yeah, some very clear but more, you know, almost like these are like astral beings combined with um, like Christianity and Christ here. It's... And then one of the last series I wanna show is the Swan, um, which is a really beautiful series. So this first one, again, you'll see these two like black and white, um, and they look like they're either kissing or about to do some sort of dance together. And then the next, she kind of moves into some interesting geometric abstraction. Um, And then ends with this, which I think is beautiful. So a lot of her paintings tend to follow that trajectory of like, there's something representational and then it kind of gets softened, mingled, maybe becomes more geometric, meets like crosses and then kind of reforms at the end in a new way. And this one I threw in for my Aunt Marilyn just because it's so Art Nouveau. Um, but it also shows like very much how she was influenced by natural imagery and the natural world and combining that um, with biblical themes and other themes um, and symbols from theosophy and the occult. Yeah, and it's, it's also very like, I think mushroom-like. Oh, I'm skipping over so much. Um... And then last in the series, um, she, which she sees as sort of the summary of all of her work um, are these altar pieces, which are just stunning. Um, and in here, there's a lot of different, um, there's like, I think watercolor and oil, um, but there's also gold leaf that's used, which was often used in like Christian, um, early Christian art from the middle ages to um, make altar pieces um, and iconography. Um, so she it not only incorporates the symbols, but also some of the, the materials and methodology in these. Oh my gosh, they're just so beautiful. Are these big ones as well? Yes. Oops. Um, oops, sorry. I'm trying to remember how big they are. I don't know if they're quite as big as the, the 10 largest. Meg, do you remember like to scale? 
Right. These are these are smaller than the 10 largest, but they're they're fairly large size pieces still. You're just not, probably not going to see footprints on them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it says like 237.5 by 179.5 centimeters. Um, so probably more meaningful just to hear that from Meg because I don't, I'm not good at centimeters. Um, but yeah, Meg was able to see the show in 2019 at the Guggenheim. Um, these in their full form. And these were in, in her vision intended to be like the last that are received at the top in sort of a, a sanctuary on top of the temple is how she saw it. Um, so speaking of the Guggenheim, she described um, this vision of having them shown in this temple, which was never realized in her lifetime, um, which is probably why she was like, y'all are not ready for this. Um, let's just hide this for a while. Um, but in, in a very uncanny, interesting way, they were eventually uncovered and shown in this space that does have sort of this spiraling effect. And I think the curator did a really good job of trying to best she could within the constructs and spaces of an art world really try to do justice to that, that wish. Um, so the intention was to like kind of spiral upwards and see each one in succession up until the 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 altar pieces. So really briefly, uh, I know that we're getting so close to one o'clock. Ah, um, but I just want to make a proposal like, okay, so the art world doesn't know what to do with her. I wonder what would happen if we put her in conversation with a different lineage um, and that of um, which we were sort of talking about before of medieval women mystics. Um, and it just occurred to me because we were talking about it in our art history class. We're talking about Hildegard von Bingen. And I was just noticing all of these and I don't, you know, these aren't meant, each one of these details isn't meant to be taken too seriously, but more as just a whole of the way that she was receiving her work and the way that her voice was being received by the world certainly has, I think, some parallels with this mystical tradition um, within and also outside of Christianity. So if you look at Hildegard's story of this woman who was, you know, creating work in a, in a woman's um, supported space outside of normative social structure um, in a communal practice, they were both 43 when they received their calling from a spirit, which I just think is kind of cool. Um, both very prolific artists who blurred boundaries across um, disciplines. Um, Hildegard has medical writings and talked a lot about healing um, and was really like heavily documented and became kind of a scholar of her own work um, and claimed her own authority through that. So I'd be curious to hear what you all think, but just kind of looking at and also created her own language, which Hilma obviously did. Um, but just, I was noticing some interesting kind of similarities in the way that Hildegard, both her, you know, how, how she was working, but also like how some, she combined biblical stories and her Christianity with, um, we might say something a little extra. <laughs> so kind of like the five got together and they're like, we're gonna do that. We're gonna start from here and return here, but we're not gonna be tethered by, um, by scripture or what we think we should be seeing or recording. So these are just some more of Hildegard's work. All right, Jennifer, I got I got a clap from Jennifer too. That's the that's the official approval that that's this tracks to some degree. <laughs> Yeah, and if you, I definitely, if you haven't encountered um, some of this work before, I mean, one, you could take Jennifer's Medieval Women Mystics class, um, but there's also a lot of writing about Hildegard's, and who is a painter, but also a, an amazing, um, created some musical compositions that were amazing also. Um, so I know that we're nearing one o'clock now. So those who can, Maybe we'll save the spiritual practice thing for another day because I know that some, I don't know, Jennifer, do you have something to do it? Are you gonna? 
close shop at one o'clock. I'm not gonna close shop. Um, I don't have, I have some meetings after, but I don't have a hard, hard stop. Um, but maybe if we could have some conversation and like you said, save yeah. the spiritual practice for another time, we could do that as an arts lunch in the summer maybe, or? Yes, I think that's a good yes. idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm, well, just in general, curious what people think about putting her kind of in the same space as Hildegard. Um, because a lot of you have looked at um, that work before and just, yeah, just curious about reactions to that or. Um, I like I like thinking about, about this um, association or thinking with her and Hildegard alongside of each other, I think makes sense. I also saw the show in whenever that was 2018 or 2019. Um, and I didn't think about, I don't think I thought about Hildegard then, um, but actually I did think of her earlier in your presentation as you were kind of framing things. And there was that one, I guess the chaos, the primordial chaos image immediately made me think of Hildegard's cosmic egg where you have also the, it's like a, people were talking about the primordial chaos images. There's this calm and in Hildegard's, I always see it because it's framed so there's this like really energetic, fiery, cosmic egg, um, but there is a kind of container or stability to it. Um, and I think Hildegard's representation is maybe more cosmic-y. A thing I really like in Hilma's work is like what you were talking about this, um, not quite tension, but maybe flipping between um, there's a better word for this, more specific word for this, but kind of flipping between whether it's um, cosmic or microscopic. Like it just feels like you're bouncing back and forth between these things. And you can't quite tell if you're looking through a microscope at a little tiny um, <laughs> organism that's like sputtering around like a, some kind of amoeba. Or are you looking at like the creation of the world uh, somehow, you know, like this thing. So I. I love that perspective, I guess, basically. Yeah. Dad, I'm gonna pick on you as the biologist in the room. What do you think about her contaminating the sciences with <laughs> a more energetic interpretation of evolution? Yeah, definitely very organic. A few of those made me think of what was beyond the borders, actually. Uh, it's like, what's going on outside of that painting? I mean, that's a weird thing, but very stunning at all. Everything's, I mean, amazing. I'm not familiar with her at all. So it's kind of an introduction for me. I'm, I'm a newbie also. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea of like, and I think it does a lot of her work, especially since it's received in this series, it does kind of to like bleed into the next one and bleed outside of the frame. Um, and it really, I mean, which kind of seems really appropriate given the big message that she was trying to tell, which is the spiritual evolution of the world and the cosmos um, was just maybe too big for her time and also too big for the, even these giant canvases. Um, so that's interesting. It's, yeah, that's an interesting noticing. Can you talk a little bit about snails <laughs> and why snails, uh, yeah, snails. Snails, yeah. And if we saw more of her work, it's, I don't know what her thing was with snails, but just like, she kind of like sneaks them in. Like there's like a little snail on top of this giant like form, just like a little snail buddy. Um, and it was like her spirit creature. Maybe it was the, I don't know. But I think, I mean, I do think that spirals were really important. Like in one of the, um, the snail forms, they're um, the symbol for spirit and matter, like the symbol for um, matter is in the, the middle actually. And then it kind of spirals and spirals and spirals. And that opening at the end of the snail is the spirit. And so it's kind of this like 
emergence of spirit from the material world, but then kind of cycling back again, um, which is, I think, you know, the embracing of this um, Christian eschatology, but also merging that with like belief in reincarnation and the this condition of the human soul to be more cyclical in some way. And, you know, I, I'd be so curious to hear or to see what she, if, how she would write that out. Um, but that's kind of what I notice about how the snail shows up and, and what it might be, what the snail is saying to us. You know, um, I just wanted to throw this in here too, is I think if that's where it might overlap with the mystics, um, the contemplate, maybe in a more of a contemplative, uh, there's this uh, form of the snail. And I think it's, um, how we come into uh, something to do with contemplative prayer. Mm. Yeah, and that was actually the spiritual, one of the spiritual practices I was going to lead us through was like drawing a spiral. But I think like, yeah, there's something about that, that motion and going up the spiral staircase, like something about that is in an, in a, an embodied way that's hard to talk about when we're not moving and like, doing something together, but I think if we can imagine just that, like, that motion, yeah, kind of a rough Snails rough. have this hard boundary between the outer and the inner. Does that have anything to do with it, you think? I mean, mm. all moll mollusks in general, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a snail and it's also kind of, yeah, like all mollusks. So it kind of more looks like a, like a nautilus or something that would be in the sea because there's like tendrils often coming out from it. Um, mollusks are cool. We should have a whole, a whole art lunch just about mollusks. One thing that I'm thinking of is that a lot of at United and in some of these spaces that we're in, Stephanie, a lot of people either describe themselves or other people or, or movements they're part of as prophetic. Um, but I'm curious about the relationship that you might think between prophetic versus being a medium, being a prophet versus being a medium. And how is this work prophetic? Is, it, is there a difference between her work in being a medium and spiritualism and sort of how she frames it? Because um, I feel like medium has a very different connotation. Uh, than profit, but both are kind of intermediate uh, between uh, or intermediary between different worlds. Yeah, that's a great question. I was definitely pondering that a lot um, in an account in doing research and kind of like looking at her work and hearing her story because it's like, do you, I mean, one with well, a question that comes to mind for me is like, do you get to call yourself a prophet <laughs> or who is the authority? basically. And I mean, I think that questions of authority really came up for me a lot in considering her work, especially in, in conversation with Hildegard and other mystics, um, is who gets to say who's, 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 whose voices that they're hearing and their own voices are, are prophetic or visionary, and who says, nah, like, like that Rudolf Steiner guy, he was like, yeah, it's a little... That makes me uncomfortable. Like, yeah, um, well, keep the seances in that room, and then any cool products that you get, like we'll look at over here in this box. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that it's clear that gender plays a role in this, Meg. <laughs> like, I want you know, like the fact that Kandinsky and Pete Mondrian, um, you know, were doing making similar connections. Um, but maybe not doing it in a, a coven <laughs> or a little group of, of, of the other women. Um, but they were able to kind of like take credit for some of what happened by making these connections. Um, but it, it definitely like raised some interesting questions about like, you know, there's also like, you know, these qualities of like of neurodivergence and, and sensitivity to environment and receiving voices, I think throughout history for women and, and other bodied folks um, have been, you know, deemed or not taken seriously because they're crazy. Or she was called like a crazy witch by some people. Um, and who gets to do that 
discernment about like what you know who we listen to and who we take seriously um I think it's I think it's a really complicated territory but unfortunately I think gender plays um, a pretty negative role in, in silencing um and boxing off you know literally putting her you know in a basement for for decades did she write uh sort of my, my follow to the prophet question Hildegard of Bingen right she compares herself to Moses and some other prophet figures in some of her writing um does yeah. does um Hilma talk about herself as a prophet does she compare herself to any other figures she doesn't um she does kind of take the Hildegard turn in that she doesn't write about herself a lot um, and she really writes about this as I'm doing this, I'm channeling this work. Like I'm, it's not, I, it's not about me. It's about as a messenger, it's the message that's coming through me. Um, she never, from what I can read, I mean, there's still like tons of her notebooks that haven't been like uncovered and translated and studied and et cetera. Um, not that they have to be translated to study, but in any case, they're still like locked up in archives, like scattered around Sweden. <laughs> so who knows, maybe she used that word, but in, in what I could, in the research I did, like she didn't compare herself. She didn't put herself in that lineage, although she also clearly did not seek to be included in the art history lineage either. So she's kind of, she kind of floats out there, I think, um, on her own until this moment. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about throughout this presentation is that um, some of you know that I've been doing the program, The Artist's Way, which, um, and, and like one of Julia Cameron's big tenets of that program, it's kind of like a 12 step program for like being an artist, I guess. Um, and, and one of the main tenets of the thing is that like God or is like a creative force and, and God like wants you to be creative sort of the same way that God is a creator. Um, and I have some sort of like mixed feelings about that, but I think, I don't know, I've just been seeing a lot of parallels between Hildegard and um, Hilma and like this sort of calling to make art and, and the sort of like this higher directive to like, to make these things that they're making. Um, so I don't really have anything to say beyond that, but just like, it's, it's I guess you, you, you could think of like Julia Cameron and, and other artists like that as um, an extension of that same legacy in some ways. And I wonder if, because you, have you done the artist way, Stephanie? Yeah. I wonder if yeah. it's about that comparison. Yeah, I think that definitely resonates. Um, I think like, at least from what I remember about doing the artist way is it's really just about like, kind of saying yes and this kind of like surrender to play and the process um regardless of whether you know what other you know the, the critic voices think um and i think that's definitely what helma offland held to um and had to if she was going to keep creating um unless she's kept wanting to do like illustrations for vet books um <laughs> I think that was definitely, you know, her path. Yeah. Stephanie, you made me think during this presentation of a small book that I had and I couldn't find where it is and I haven't been able to find it for so long and I found it. So I think it's in tune. It's something that you should borrow. It's called We Believe in Infinite Intelligence. It's a 21st century guide to spiritualism that my friend put together. And one thing that when I remember reading this that I was really interested in kind of blown away by is this like and this has a lot of photos of like spiritualist photography so like images that like portray a ghost or something or like a spirit of some kind but there's this element of performance to it um and I wonder if you can I guess I'm just like interested in this sort of like yes we believe in this like knowledge of spiritualism and that we can be mediums but also we believe in this like performative aspect of our mediumship yes and you mentioned this about, um, you mentioned this earlier, and I was just wondering if you, first you should borrow this someday, but I wonder if you can say anything else to that in your research that you found. Oh my gosh, I love that, I'd love to borrow it. Also, we should 
we should definitely do some sort of like performance art piece about spiritualism. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think w one thing I did, I noticed a lot in doing this research um, was that the spiritualism movement was also kind of like seen as, especially it was seen as like both taken, some of the ideas were taken seriously. There was like, like you know, it was lectures about theosophy, um, but that performance of the ability to, you know, reach these higher truths from a more mystical space was definitely like not taken seriously. And there was like a lot of shade thrown to Helena Blodowatsky and the, the Fox sisters. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think that a lot of that is it's like, yeah, they were kind of, you know, they pulled people's legs and they were a little shady in some ways, but this was the avenue they had to have a voice of authority. And who's to say that some of the things that they were tapping into and channeling um, just because you, maybe the world wasn't ready, who's to say that there wasn't truth or validity to what they were picking up on. Um, and of course they took advantage of it. Like I would too, if that was like, people were like noticing and like, you know, they're able to actually make a living off of this and also have access to travel because they were able to like pull off these performances of like levitating each other, et cetera. So there's that side of it, but I think that there was like a genuine spiritual community behind some of these ideas also. Um, so as, as Demi would say, I think it's a definitely kind of a, a both and, and I think they get more shade because there was a lot of, a lot of women were doing this, these, this presenting um, and choosing a life that was sort of unconventional. So of course they're gonna get critiqued for that, um, for not settling down and starting a family that kind of thing. You know, Stephanie, I'm wondering um, if, did she give like um, any instructions uh, from her paintings? Did she write about, or was she, was this an expression of what she was experiencing or now does it also become sort of a roadmap for the rest of us? Was there anything with that where, how do we, does she tell us how to respond to the painting? Well, she did, she gave us the keys of the colors and all that, so in a way, uh, she's telling us that this is a language and, and how maybe to interact with these paintings, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right on. Like she, I think it's a combination, it seems, between, you know, creating this kind of like legend for these spiritual maps, you might say, um, to kind of decode pieces. But at the same time, I think her intent, just like the way that she created it, it kind of like flowed through her in the succession. She also meant for it to be received, kind of like we looked at the 10 largest, just to received as a whole also. So I think it, it seems from her notes and some of the visions she recorded was that she really wanted both of those things to be at play. So she was very, and I think that kind of embodies her work like she was very meticulous in the way that she wanted to have this like systematic view um, and combined you know she kind of a scientific mind and insights but also you know said that you know the sum of all of this is something bigger and more mystical and magical and mysterious than um, any one of us can can kind of contain so yeah dad like the, sp the spilling over of the boundaries <laughs> I think that's how how she would have wanted us to to take it in. I'm aware that it's, a, it's 15 after, um, so maybe we should give Jennifer back her Zoom room. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and give Stephanie a big Zoom round of applause. Oh, thank you. Presentation. Thank you all for coming. I'm guessing we have a, a bunch of new Hilma uh, converts. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do some more playing with her in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll be in touch about the um, spiritual practice for a yeah. future Earthlands. Definitely, maybe for a summertime. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Nice to meet all of you. Great job, Steph.